Tom Dickinson, which is apparently not his name, and he is a project technical lead for OpenStack Swift, and he is going to talk about awesome things. Thank you. So as, as Kim said, uh, Liz said, I'm so sorry. As Liz said, uh, my name is John. Uh, I work on OpenStack Swift. I've been working on that since 2009, and uh, it's, it's great. Uh, today, I am not going to tell you about like, exactly all of the reasons that you should be using object storage and why it's so important to have object storage that's open source and you can deploy in your own data center and have control of your own data and all of that stuff. I'm going to tell you about a particular nuance and a, and a really cool feature that was implemented this year in, in Swift that allowed, that has to do with data placements across a distributed storage cluster and kind of some cool technical background details that uh, did, you don't normally get to, get to understand. And, but I have to call out specifically to say that I was not the person who wrote this. Uh, it's a huge community team effort, but specifically, Christian Suida, uh, who lives in Germany, uh, is the primary author of this patch and this feature. And so I'd definitely like to call him out and say thank you very much for the, the great work. Uh, a few things, uh, a few times I'm going to call on the audience, and a few times I'll have some opportunity for questions, and then there should be some time at the end. And so with that being said, I was thinking about what I was going to talk about and then a clever title to come up with it. And I thought, OK, so we're going to make a bigger pie. And that should hopefully make sense by the, by the end of this talk. And being from the United States, I then realized that pie isn't the same thing as what I was used to. And while I was preparing this, I saw one of my Australian friends tweet, retweeting this, uh, this tweet from the ABC saying that, have you ever wondered what's in the classic Australian meat pies? Which apparently the best answer is uh, yes, but you try not to dwell on it. <laughs> so let's, let's move on then. What is Swift? So I have a modest proposal to you. I want to tailor this presentation to meet your expectations. I want to drive home the right messages so that you can bank on the benefits and do something on your iPhone. There's lots of different Swifts out there. Uh, they do lots of different sorts of things. But the Swift that we are talking about today is part of the OpenStack project. It's an object storage system. And its point is to reliably and durably store data. You can conceptually think about it as like Amazon S3, but you, it's open source and you can put it in your own data center. But it is. And at it, its most boiled down sense, it's the whole point of a system like Swift, and Swift's, Swift specifically, is to abstract away your data from the media upon which it is stored. And that abstraction gives you a huge amount of power. What it means is that you can do some really big scale things because you're not locked in or tied to a single point of failure of any piece of hardware. It also means that you, the hardware can come and go. And if you were in Gus's talk earlier today, then you know that Hardware failure is a completely normal and expected state of hardware. And so when hardware fails, uh, servers or hard drives or anything like that, it's totally OK. And the system can completely worry about, uh, work around that without you having to worry about your data that is stored upon that media being unavailable or even worse, lost. And then furthermore, you can upgrade your data, it, your, your media, so that at, over time to use the best thing available. So when I first started working on Swift, we were using massive two and three terabyte hard drives. And I think maybe you could get a four terabyte hard drive some, someplace. And these days, 10 terabyte hard drives are no big deal. And, and 12 and 16 will be coming very shortly. So the whole point of Swift is to provide you a durable, available, massively scalable, massive throughput storage system so that you can uh, store and serve static content. If you have, if you have data like backups, pictures, any static media on the on uh, that's served on the internet, um, videos. Uh, I've seen Swift used everywhere from making movies to supporting video games to serving up web pages to storing backups to serving genomic data. All kinds of things all over the world. These are the kind of things that Swift is really, really great at. So that's the Swift we're talking about. And we're going to dive into specifically, if you've got a large distributed set of hardware, how do we figure out where things were, are put in that cluster? And then how can you change that? As a quick, just 
very high level, the Swift API is REST-based, which means that you can speak to it with standard HTTP verbs and get back normal response codes. And this is what a normal URL looks like. You've got your domain name, you've got a, a version uh, specifier, which has always been V1, and then you've got three parts that are important. You've got an account, a container, and an object. An account is kind of like a bank account in that it's as opposed to like a user. It's, it's a place where you put stuff and you have access to it. You might give somebody else access to it, but really it's just a place where you put stuff, a place where you take things out of. A container is a way that you can organize, sub, subdivide your account namespace, and then your objects are what you put in, uh, just all of the kind of, um, you know, your, your cat pictures and, and things like that. So, what we're talking about again is how do we translate this to a location inside of a distributed storage cluster? And Swift uses a technique called consistent hashing. And that is a really, a really cool thing that gives you some really interesting uh, properties. So let's break that down. What is consistent hashing? Start with, we all know what hashing is. Hashing is really taking a big set of stuff and then figuring out some shortcut to group it into smaller numbers of buckets. And so you think about an encyclopedia. And if you're going to go look up octopus, well, that's hashed by the first letter, the O. So you pick out the O volume, and you go look up octopus. And you do aardvark, and you're going to look at A. So we're all really familiar with that. We've got, we use that with encyclopedias traditionally. Unfortunately, we don't have actual dead tree encyclopedias anymore. Dictionaries, even your phone contacts, you, you sort that by first name or last name or things like this. So it allows you to easily look up where something is and find, um, to really limit the, get a subset of the overall, uh, if you've got hundreds of phone contacts, you only have to look at the M's so I can find Matt or something like that. It's, it, it's just a really fast way to look up things. So here's an example of a couple of hash functions. We're going to pass in a value to some hash function, and we're going to get out our key. And that's just a shortened subset. So uh, here's not great ones, but uh, two examples. One would be we are simply going to look at the first letter. That's pretty easy. We convert it to a string and take off the first byte, right? Good. The other, another common way is to say that, well, let's treat everything as numbers. And if it's an even number, we're going to put it in one bucket. If it's an odd number, we're going to put it in a different bucket. And that's pretty nice. Think about this. You're a web developer, and you don't really want to think about storage, so you're going to start putting things in a bucket, a hard drive someplace. And everything's great, but your hard drive starts to fill up. So you need to put it in a second hard drive. But now you've got two hard drives, and you can either write down exactly where all of your, it, this is in hard drive A or this is in hard drive B. But if maybe you could just say, I'm giving everything an ID number, and the even ones go over here, and the odd ones go over here, then you don't have to maintain this big table lookup of, Object one goes in hard drive A, and object two goes in hard drive B, and it's kind of nice. You just take the, the ID number. If it's even, it goes here. If it's odd, it goes there. So it's pretty nice. Until you run out of space in those two buckets. And then what happens? So if you're using, let's say, the simple even and odd hashing scheme, what happens when you need to add a third bucket? What happens to all of the existing hashed stuff? Any ideas? So the third one would be odd, so it would have to be go there. But what about the previous stuff? What was, you, you already sorted something that was 22. So what, does that go into the first, second, or now the third bucket? The problem is you have to rehash everything. And the more you actually add on, you have to, add, you have to keep rehashing more and more. So it's not, it's not a really great system uh, because it doesn't allow for expansion without having to rehash a huge amount of data. And when we're talking about storage systems, we're, we kind of start talking about small clusters of hundreds of terabytes, and uh, interesting clusters are multiple petabytes. And so you get hundreds to thousands of servers and hard drives, and you really don't have the ability to say, let's go rehash five petabytes of data just because we plugged in a new hard drive. You can't do that. So there must be a better way. So when we're talking about the, those two things, like a first letter or uh, even an odd, are not great for something like Swift. So what kind of things do we need from a hash function in Swift? We need a few characteristics. We need something that's relatively fast, because we've got to do a lot of, a lot of this. We want something that gives you good distribution across all of the available buckets, all of the available hard drives that you have. You want something that's deterministic, so that if you hash something a second time, you get the same value out. 
And ideally, you would like to have something where you could take a subset of the resulting bits that came out of the hash function, and they have these same properties of being nicely distributed, and so you can, you can kind of uh, slice that hash function and, and um, do some extra things there. And so basically, these are functions that, uh, these are uh, attributes of a cryptographic hash function. And so that's the kind of things you use. So we got a, a cryptographic hash function, and so we need to now turn that into a ring. Remember I was talking, I, I said that we use a consistent hash ring for data placement. So uh, we've, we've got the hash as far as we've got a, a cryptographic hash function, and now we need to turn it into a ring. So that's not too hard. All you do for turning something into a ring is saying if you've got the very last, uh, if you add one to the very last, the very biggest possible hash value, then it just wraps around to zero. You're good to go. So now you logically have a ring. So you can walk around the ring. You keep adding one, 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 uh, until you get to, say, 128-bit hash. And 2 to the 128th minus 1 is the biggest value you could possibly have. You add 1 to that, and you get 0 again. So we're good to go. Now we've got a ring. So a basic, the basic idea of consistent hashing takes this ring and then hashes stuff onto it. So Let's say you're going to put a few hard drives, uh, you put data on a few different hard drives. So let's take a unique identifier of this hard drive. It could be some UUID, uh, but maybe it's going to be like a, um, the mount point for that hard drive. It may be like the IP and a mount point for that drive. So now you know that every different hard drive you have across your servers are going to have this unique value. So put it in the hash function, and you're going to get out some number, and that's a kind of this location around the ring. So that's nice. And the really cool thing about this is when you come in and you're going to save your cat picture, then you hash whatever unique identifier for your cat picture, say the name of it, and that gives you another location in the ring. Start walking around the ring clockwise. The first time you find a hard drive location, put it on that hard drive, and you're good to go. And this is a super powerful idea that gives you the ability to disperse your data around. And you can imagine in this picture here, for example, if you added in a fourth hard drive, you don't have to rehash everything. All you have to do is rehash the, the, the one segment of pi, the one part of that, um, that hash key space, uh, and only the data inside of that. So I've greatly simplified uh, this picture, of course. Uh, and you can imagine, though, that when you have many, many, many things around here, you get a, a nice kind of evenish distribution of uh, hard drive locations throughout the ring. And so the great thing about this is that your data becomes evenly dispersed as you get more and more data, just kind of evenly balances throughout all of your hard drives. It gives you the ability to look up where anything is or know where everything should list only by knowing the hash function and where these hard drives are. So if you say that hard drive three hashes to the values, this, this particular value, that's, that's all you need to know is here's the hash function, and here's the list of, of the, the hard drive locations. And you don't have to store. You, you can deterministically repeat this, and, it, and it's, um, you can find anything you need in the entire cluster. But there are a couple disadvantages to this. It sounds really great to start with, but there's a couple of disadvantages with this. And one of them you can see here is that the allocation is not necessarily even. And you have to walk around the drive to find the right place. So that gives you a little bit of extra complexity and extra time that it'd be nice to remove. So it's not ideal. So skipping forward a few iterations on how this would work, this is one way you can solve that. Take that same ring and divide it into equal sized partitions based on the prefix of the hash output. So in this particular case, just as a question to the audience, how many bits of prefix am I using? Four, I see in the back. Great. Uh, exactly right. So in this, pay, in, this grade, uh, in this case, we have two to the fourth possibilities of, uh, of partitions around this that are evenly sized, which means that we can easily hash anything, grab the four, first four bits, and know exactly which partition it goes to. We don't have to walk around this ring anymore, which gives you, uh, it removes like a binary tree search uh, across that key space. So that can help you speed up some things up. And you also know that each one of these partitions is responsible for an even number of keys. 
uh, in the overall hash space, which means you can get fairly even responsibility so that the, uh, the partition that's responsible for, uh, or, or you, there's an equal number of keys that, are, that start with each individual prefix. So that's pretty nice. So in this case, um, well, in Swift, this is, this is the method that we use. And it, uh, we have a phrase or a, a, a variable, a, a name of something, and it's called a partition power or part power. And in this case, the part power is simply the number of bits that you're using for prefix. So again, the part power in this particular ring is four. So there's one trick that we have left, which is how do we assign those particular partitions to a particular hard drive so that we know that when we hash something to partition seven, we know that it's going to go exactly to the, hard, the right hard drive that gives you like things. I'm gonna come back to that in just a minute. If you'd like, this is a fascinating topic that has been, uh, that has been, it's about 20 years old. And in 1997, so I guess actually uh, 21 years old this year, uh, the concept of consistent hashing was first introduced in this, in this first uh, paper, Consistent Hashing and Random Trees. And interestingly enough, this paper is what went on to kind of form some of the technical basis behind Akamai, the CDN storage company. Uh, David Carger is one of the authors on this paper and uh, was one of the, one of the two founders of, of Akamai. The other paper that is 10 years after the, uh, the Akamai paper, the consistent hashing paper, is, or was released in 2007 and it's Am Amazon's Dynamo paper. It's probably a bit more famous as a paper goes. And uh, in most uh, distributed systems, you can just reference, hey, it's the Dynamo paper, and uh, we talk, it, it describes a lot of these improvements. So the consistent hashing, uh, the first paper, uh, introduced the concept of we've got a ring, uh, hash function into a ring, and we can uh, put things around the ring in different nodes and get nice, even distribution. The, uh, the Dynamo paper uh, expanded on that and talked about the fixed size partitions and being able to, the, the characteristics in a production system that you get from that by being able to add and remove capacity without having to rehash a lot of things and stuff like that. So for background, these are two very approachable and uh, interesting uh, and historically significant uh, academic papers that you could go read. So this is a picture of a very, very simple ring in Swift. And it is, this is, so remember I said there was, there was one trick that, was, uh, that we still had to figure out, which is how do we map the rings to particular drives? And here it's kind of color coded, and, uh, but you can see that in this, and, and one difference here is we've got three concentric rings for, instead of just one, one particular ring. And that's because we've got uh, normally, uh, like a default storage policy might have three replicas uh, for the, uh, in, in a particular, in, in the cluster. So what you can see here is perhaps like the, the dark blue or the dark purple there is mapped to a particular drive and you can see that different partitions and different replicas of each partition is mapped to a particular drive. So that's really where the trick comes out. So uh, we'll come back to how we actually map that but I wanted to show this picture as we've taken a hash function, we've looped it, we've then divided it into equal size partitions and then we have, uh, now we have replicas of that and we've assigned each of the partitions to a particular hard drive. So, with me so far? I'm seeing, I'm seeing nods, so that's great. Okay, now let's get back into, if that's the theory, what does some of the code actually look like of how this works? So, data placement in Swift. Remember I said that thing at the top there, I said that there are, um, that the, what the basic API looks like. And so I've, I've color coded this a, a bit. And so you've got your account, your container, and the object. And these are the three important pieces that feed into the hashing algorithm for Swift. So in this case, we hash the account container and object. And in this case, we add in a, a prefix and a suffix. We uh, join all those as way into the normalized form and then we throw it in MD5 and get out 120 bits of output. So that gives us something to work with. So once we do that, uh, we are able to take that key and we are going to find the partition number. So there's a lot going on here, but there's two things I wanna point out. One is where it says four bytes equals unpack from. Uh, the thing that that's doing there is taking that key, 
that we saw on that line above there, we hash, hash, we, we hash the path just like we saw in the last, in the last picture. And uh, we, we grab the first four bytes. What that allows us to do is gives us 32 bits to work with, which is quite a, quite a bit when you're talking about 2 to the 32 for uh, the number of possible buckets that you could do. The second thing here is we then right shift that prefix by some number of bits. In this case, if we shift it by 22 bits, then we get a part power of 10. So there's 32 possible uh, bits that we have. We shift it by 22 bits. So 32 minus 22 is 10 bits that you have. So you're getting, so when you, when you think about the, the array of bits that you have, the first 10, the leftmost in kind of human normalized uh, views, are those, those 10 bits that we're looking for. So which means that how many different partitions do we have possible? Anyone? Two to the 10th, exactly. So we have 1,024 parti potential partitions in uh, this particular uh, example that I'm showing here. So the last thing I wanted to point out is that the partition power, this is important, is set. So you've, you see the 10 that's up there in orange. The partition power is set at the time of cluster creation. So the question then becomes, what kind of partition power should you use? I don't know. Depends on how big your cluster is eventually going to be. But if you're setting it at cluster creation, that gives you a bit of tension of not knowing exactly the right number to choose. So to finish out the actual uh, the example here, when we have a part power of 10, let's say these are the bits we get out of the hash function. We grab the first four bits, we, sh uh, we right shift it, and then you can see that we have some uh, uh, the, the actual uh, partition number that's, that's left over. If you're curious, the partition number actually works out to a decimal number 67. It's just completely arbitrary and random. Okay, so we're going to come back to this. You'll see this uh, repeated with a little change in, in, uh, in a little bit long, a uh, few minutes. So, I said there was that trick we had to come back to. And this is, again, remember, a picture of a very simplified ring inside of Swift. So, we need to map the partitions to the drives. We need to ensure that any particular slice of this pie around this ring, so you've got the ring, you've got these little pie slices of partitions all the way around, you need to make sure that all of the replicas there don't overlap. You don't want to assign the same drive for multiple replicas, because if one drive dies, then you've lost two or three replicas and your data's gone, and that's not good. You also want to make sure that it's not just drives, but maybe those are not two drives on the same server, Maybe there aren't two servers in the same rack or even two racks in the same data center. You'd like to make this, the data as distributed as possible. So that's one constraint. You want to make sure that the data, the mapping uh, is for a partition to a particular drive is as distributed as possible for fail, failure domains. That gives you some great durability and great availability in the case of hardware failure. But the other thing is you don't always have this exact same kind of hardware deployed. So uh, you need to account for the fact that you've got some bigger hard drives and some smaller hard drives and some servers with more hard drive bays and some uh, servers with fewer. So you need to account for that and still make sure it's as dispersed as possible, which is kind of a weird way to say that if you have uh, uh, it, balancing out your ability to recover from a particular failure uh, domain failing, but also not uh, being able to use all of the space that, uh, that you want so that you could say keep every hard drive at roughly say 80% full instead of uh, you are limited at 80% of the smallest hard drive in your cluster. And so you need to balance those two things. And that, to be honest, is really hard. Uh, that's, that process of doing that mapping is not something I'm going to, into here, but ultimately, this is what it turns down to. It turns into a big lookup table. We've got a set of partitions and a set of devices that it goes to. And in, in Swift's case, we'll have one device for every replica assigned to a particular partition. Uh, so, but remember this. This is, this is ultimately, this is it. The ring that we're, that we're using in Swift is really just a big lookup table. We've got one row for every single uh, partition, and so those are then mapped to our devices. Okay. Back to this simplified view. Back to the simplified view. If, if we set it at partition, if we set the uh, partition power at ring creation, 
what do you set it to? You just kind of guess. And it, it's not, I mean, you can make a very educated guess. You know that you're not probably going to start with 10 hard drives and eventually go to grow to 100,000 hard drives. That's just a bit aggressive on your growth patterns, potentially. Uh, but, you know, what are you going to go to? It's, it's, it's somewhat hard. But the problem is, if you choose a number that's too small, your, your data placement is going to be too lumpy. But if you choose a number that's too big, you have a lot of extra overhead in the system that it's harder to do. Um, it's harder to get all of the... Um, you're just not as efficient on your storage. You're, you're taking up more space and time on the system for uh, handling all of the overhead for that. <coughs> okay, so here's the other problem. What, what happens if we need to change the partition power? What happens if we said, you know, I, I'm, it's not gonna be that big and I don't think I'm gonna need a very big partition power, and then all of a sudden it is. What happens if you needed to roll in another doubling the size of your hardware capacity and you didn't really account for that if you chose too small? So remember back when we were talking about that even odd hash bucket problem? If we change the partition power and everything, if now we're using five bits instead of four, then you have to rehash everything. You can't do that. That's the problem that we, we can't, can't do. And so if you've already got data there, how do you do that? How do you rehash the data? And that you, you just don't. So it's hard. So. Everybody with me so far? This is, this is my first big stop for questions. We're all good with the challenges around how do we choose where to place data in Swift and the basic high level understanding that in Swift we use a ring, a hash function that we then um, choose a prefix number of bits and we have those assigned to a set of hard drives, one for each replica. All with me so far? Okay, so now here's the cool part. Since we're just dealing with prefix bits, we may actually be able to solve this problem of changing the number, the part power, in a production cluster with data already in it without having to rehash and move all of the data around. So how are we gonna do this? The power of math, of course. So remember this, we sh uh, showed you this earlier. Uh, this is kind of interesting. Remember that first thing, we, uh, we grabbed the first four bytes, we shift it by 22, giving us 10 bits to work with. Well, what happens if we shifted it by 21? So we have a part power of 11. In this case, the first value, remember I said the, part po uh, the actual partition number is 67. In the other case, we added a, we added a zero to the end of that. We've now got a part power of 134. So we get one more binary digit on the right-hand side of that partition, which means that there's a very definite mathematical relationship between the old partition value and the new partition value, because you know that that extra binary digit is either a zero or a one. Now, if it's a zero, it's pretty easy because you know that the partition is simply doubled because you've got one more. It's either, it's, that's good. If it's going to be a one though, it's doubled plus one. So that's the simple relationship that we've got. Uh, does, uh, we, if we increase the partition power by one, the hash function in Swift will return a partition that is either 2x or 2x plus one, what that old hash value could have been. So that gives us a way to map old to new. But the problem is that it's still going to mess up our mapping. So can we tackle that? We, we, we have mapped, say, uh, partition one used to go over here. Maybe uh, partition one went to device seven. So it's either going to be partition two or it's gonna be partition three because it's two X or two X plus one. So we still need to, to figure that out. So what happens if we take this partition table that we've got the lookup table and then we rewrite it. Notice that the device column has stayed exactly the same. We've just doubled it every time. And then we kept an incrementing index of the, the partition, which means that exactly what I just said, if we had partition one that used to go to device seven, now partitions two and three both go to device seven. So it's, we've made sure that the old partition power, uh, whatever that was assigned to, the new partition power, or 
2x or 2x plus 1 and 2x plus 1 of that old value now both map to the same value. When we remap the table like this, the really cool thing about this is there's actually zero data movement in the entire cluster because everything is still ex uh, assigned to the exact same hard drive that it used to be assigned to. We've simply doubled the number of things that we have available to move around and distribute data, which is kind of cool because it also means that before we doubled this, we, uh, before and after, after the doubling, we have the exact same dispersion and balance metrics that we had beforehand. We just chopped it up. So that's kind of neat. That gives, we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel on a way we might be able to increase partition power by knowing the relationship between the old and the new and uh, being able to remap this table. Note here that one thing I haven't said is that we're increasing the partition power simply by one. We're not increasing it by multiple bits at a time. That would, we're, just, we're just sticking with one at a time here. So you can go from four to five and five to six, but you can't go from four straight to seven or anything else. There's one more problem that we have here, and that is when we're actually talking about the data that is on disk, the on disk layout itself. So we've changed the partition power. So if the partition power is part of anything in the on-disk data structure, uh, how it's actually organized on the hard drive itself, we've got to solve that too. So surely, surely we didn't encode that in our on-disk data format. That would, have, that would have been crazy and really hurt us out. So it turns out we did. And uh, the, the on-disk, the pattern that we have for the way things are laid out on the file system on a hard drive inside of Swift is we've got some mount point and prefix, so we get to the right hard drive uh, and, our, and, our, and our parent directory on there. And then we have a series of directories. The first one is the partition number, the second one is uh, a suffix, and the third one is the hash. So the hash is the, the uh, actual hash of the full, that normalized hash that I talked about with the prefix, the suffix, and the account container and object name all, all crammed together in a normalized form. The suffix is really just a splaying method, and it's the last few bits or last few bytes of the of the hash itself. So here's an example of of one that we have. We have say a partition number sixteen thousand three, and then we have this particular hash, and you can see that a thirty eight is the particular suffix that we're using. So we've got what this means is that we know that this is the starting state. This is the ending state that we want to get to. If we rehashed we're going to, in this particular case, you can see that if we would remap this to uh, 2x plus 1, uh, and the data could be located in any one of these places, either one of these places, the old location and the new location. The problem is, how do we get from the old to the new? That's the migration thing. I've got production data in this system. I can't turn it off. I can't rehash everything and turn the cluster off while I'm doing this. I have to make sure that I can still read and write the data if it's in the old place or the new place at the same time. So that's the doing it in a live cluster thing. So we start with this. Uh, we know the old location. We know the new location. So the solution to this that we have is we use hard links. So hard link the two things together. And you can read and write it in one location. And it will reflect in the same, which means that if you've got the old copy of the ring that had the, not, the, the, the old part power or something that was uh, uh, used the new part power, which happens in a rolling upgrade on a distributed cluster, then you can access it in both locations. So that's pretty cool. That basically gets down to the whole theory of how the stuff works and is, and is all put together. So let's talk about the actual practice. Now in my little, uh, in my abstract that I had in the agenda, uh, I had, a, I had uh, shall we say, uh, aggressively promised a, a demo of this. Uh, and, I, and I started trying to think about that, or what that would look like. And I realized it would be terribly boring because it's just, here's some CLI stuff and ta-da, it worked, trust me. So instead of that, I just figured I'd actually put it in readable text instead of doing it on a terminal. And there's a few CLI uh, commands that we do. It's a three-step process in an existing running Swift cluster that you can now move the partition power from whatever it was to one more, which gives you the ability to kind of grow over time. So the first thing that we have to do is we update the ring and we tell it to prepare to increase the partition power. We write that out and then um, 
that does something, it, puts, it turns on a flag in the ring that you've distributed out, and it turns off all of the background replication. So that's, that's the first like warning. Uh, we're gonna turn off the background uh, consistency engine pieces, uh, which means that uh, what, you don't want the, uh, the background replication moving it from one hard drive to another hard drive and duplicating all of the data that you have out there. So um, once you deploy that ring, then you have to run this relinker process. And the relinker process is what sets up all of those hard links. So it's not, it's not a particularly complex process, but it can take a little while because it has to walk the entirety of the hard drive, and that could take an hour or two, depending on how much, how much data you have in the hard drive. And it, but it doesn't move any data. It just creates a whole bunch of hard links. For anything that data it found, it, it creates the hard links for the new stuff. So once that is finished, then you can actually increase the partition power and write that ring distributed out. And this is what does that table remapping. Remember we, we uh, duplicated the length of the table and then we remapped it so we uh, have it assigned all to the right places, but it's either the uh, 2x par uh, partition or 2x plus one. This will, uh, the other thing that this does is prevents the writes from creating the additional hard links. So uh, in the, when we were just preparing to increase, if we had a new write to come in, it would, it would write it in the correct location, but also create a hard link to the old location uh, so that we have everything just right. We can get to it however we need to, no matter who's trying to access it. Once we've increased the partition power, that's good. We've rewritten the table, so we know the right places where everything is supposed to be, and once that's out, distributed to the entire cluster, we don't have to create those hard links on a new write anymore so that we can stop doing uh, that extra work. So uh, they're already created for all the old content, but all the new stuff is going exactly where it's supposed to be in the new location. And then once, uh, once that has been distributed out, then we can clean up all those hard links. We don't need them anymore because every, every part of the system knows all of the right places where it's supposed to be. Again, there's no data movement in this, but it does have to walk that entire drive to now clean up the hard links. And uh, so once, uh, once, you do, once you've cleaned up all the hard links, you can finish this and that will re-enable all the background consistency engine, the replication demons, uh, so that your data can continue to be healthy. So that's the basic three-step process. You prepare, you increase, and then you finish. So that gives you the really great thing about this and the, the reason that I'm fairly excited about this functionality being available in Swift means that even on a manual basis, you can start small and grow big without having to have any downtime in your cluster, which is really important. And it means that even with some clever automation, you could just continue put, uh, put in new hard drives and your management system could say, oh, I see that you're starting to run out of partitions. It may be a good idea to increase this. Let's go through this process and you're good to go. But that gives you, uh, starts to give you a question on, well, what's the right part power we should be using? So what are recommendations for a good part power on a cluster? And uh, using a fairly simple uh, rule of thumb of if we target at the maximum size that we have about 100 partitions assigned per hard drive, uh, which gives you, you know, each partition is roughly responsible for 1% of the data on there, which means that you don't have a huge amount of variation in the, uh, the overall balance of your cluster, then you can look at it this way. If you've got 10, 10 drives, you can have a part per hour of nine. If you've got 10,000 drives, a part per hour of 19. Uh, and there's not too much. It's really just the biggest power of two uh, that is, gives you that number. So notice, though, that I'm doing this based on number of drives and not particularly the drive capacity. Um, so what size does this, does this end up doing? Uh, just, again, uh, kind of some quick uh, and rough back of napkin math. If you had 110 terabyte drives, that would give you a roughly uh, 223 uh, terabytes of usable space with triple replicas and a target of 80% full. If you were using something like erasure codes, uh, you could uh, get up to nearly uh, 500 terabytes with 100 drives. So uh, that can kind of give you an idea of, you know, if you need a certain number of petabytes, you're going to be able to use this and this storage policy, then you can, uh, this is roughly the part power you have. But the great thing is here now, if you've started with 100 drives, and you need it to grow over time to 1,000 drives, you can do that seamlessly and not have the extra overhead of all of the file system metadata and the extra time it takes to, uh, to account for that sort of stuff. So 
Unfortunately, though, there's warnings, there's costs, there's risks, and there's the kind of here be dragons parts of this. And the big things that I can think of here is that we're unlinking the hard links at some point. Unlinking data in a storage system is always a terrifying experience. You don't really want to do that because you never want to lose data. So it's, it's a little bit scary there. I think it's pretty safe, but uh, you know, you're unlinking stuff. Uh, there's obviously extra load that you're in introducing on the hard drives to be able to crawl the drives to, uh, to create these hard links and figure out what's there. Uh, the, the hard links themselves will use extra inodes, and that can fill up the drive, uh, even if your uh, capacity in bytes is not completely full. And again, you want to make sure you go through this process fairly quickly as possible. Uh, so, because replication is not running in the background while this is happening. Now, the good news is the bigger clusters, uh, well, they will be harder to migrate because it will take longer to do this uh, process. But the good news is as the numbers get bigger, you don't have to do it nearly as often. So that's kind of nice. So overall, that is how we make a bigger pie. We start small, we go big, and we have a nice American apple pie there. <laughs> So with that being said, are there any questions? I know I kind of went through that fast. It kind of goes through some uh, intricate details of how Swift is put together, uh, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Can you? Yes, sir. I can, I can repeat the question, too. Uh, we have a mic coming. When you remove the um, hard links, do you look at the count of how many uh, objects you're actually pointing at so you don't accidentally remove a link to uh, a file that only has one hard link to it? <laughs> no, I don't believe that we are tracking the actual link counts on that particular hard link. Uh, there are some times I could think that potentially you may have only one link there, but it's still OK to delete it because it's, uh, it could have been uh, data that has been deleted. It, the, what, we, what we are looking for is going through that process we know that the data will be referenced in the new locations successfully, uh, so the old locations are fine. Yes, sir. So, so in a simple state, if you have the process of removing hard things die or something halfway through, it's still fine. <laughs> Um, there is a, and I left it out because this isn't really an operations course in this, but um, the, if I remember correctly, the, you can prepare and you can, but there is, there is a point of no return. And I believe that that's on that second step. If instead you realize, nope, I don't want to do this, there is actually a functionality uh, and an ability to cancel the part power increase. And at that point, you'll go clean it up, and it'll clean up the right hard links, and, and you're, you're all OK. Um, but once you have actually committed to, we have increased the partition power, it is the point of no return. You cannot go backwards. You cannot shrink the part power. And uh, at that point, you need to go. Now, cleaning up the hard links, if you, if you stopped that process halfway through, that's fine. That, you're just going to end up with extra inode overhead for a while. Right, and you could restart that uh, cleanup process later on, and that's fine. Um, but as you're going through this process, there is a, there's a point where you have to say, am I going on or am I not? And uh, at that point, it is a point of no return. Um, that's what we've got time for now. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Here's a gift that you can enjoy. Thank you very much. Um, if anyone's got any questions, feel free to grab a hold of them afterwards. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.